Hi, thanks so much for joining in. You're watching the Mutual Fund Show on NDTV Profit. My name is Alex Matthew. Now, we speak about a number of uh, issues related to mutual funds, but we don't often talk about the selling of mutual fund. And this conversation, at least the first half of this conversation, relates to how the mutual fund distributor community is going to be dealing with a change in norms that relate to commissions. How that affects you is one of the aspects of this conversation. But to break things down for you, I've got Ashish Somaya, Chief Executive Officer of White Oak Capital, as well as Kirtan Shah, who's the Managing Director at Cretan's Family Office, joining in. Thank you so much to the both of you for taking the time and for speaking to us on NDTV Profit. Let's start with uh, a little bit of context, because I think uh, Ashish, Kirtan, a lot of people joining in, uh, of course, a lot of them, because they're watching the mutual fund show, know the difference between direct and regular, but let's set the context, right? Uh, there are two types, and I'll start with you. Uh, there are two types of distribution models. Either, as an investor, I go to the website of an EMC and buy, that's direct. How does regular work? Uh, so Alex, in regular what happens is you are typically working through an intermediary, can be a bank or a, or a broking house or a wealth management setup, where you are invariably looking at a better advice from that intermediary to help you reach your financial goals and for which you are probably willing to let go of or pay a slightly higher expense ratio to the mutual fund. Mm. Right. So when you go direct, you probably might end up paying 70 paisa for for a particular fund but if you go through the regular mode it, that might be higher to 1.2 ideally the difference between the direct and and the regular is the expense that you're willing to bear to get an intermediary on board uh, assuming that that intermediary will be able to add a lot of value versus mm. you wanting to do it direct okay ashish from the perspective of the industry um, it's a given that most of the schemes that are sold are sold through the regular route why do you think that is? So I think uh, first thing, important point to clarify is that as far as asset management industry is concerned, like mutual fund companies are concerned, commercially we are indifferent, hmm. right? Uh, whether it comes through direct or comes through an intermediary. So right. the way the regulation is cast, management fee is the same for both hmm. and we are absolutely indifferent. Sure. But having said so, uh, it's a regulatory requirement that you should offer both, hmm. right? You offer direct and you offer the intermediate regular. class, which is regular. Now it's obvious that Two reasons why regular has more assets. Uh, one clearly is related to maturity of the market, right? Because there are so many people who are just about getting introduced to mutual funds, right? So it's quite likely that a lot of them hear about it for the first time mm. from a friendly neighborhood, uh, you know, mutual fund distributor. Mm. It's about access. It's about where do you hear it the first time. Mm. And second also is important to understand that uh, I say it on a funny lighter note that to buy some 300, 400 good companies, we have some three, 4,000 different uh, mutual fund schemes. Yes. So it's not easy. Yeah. Right. Our industry is notorious for making things nuanced and complex. So I think people do need guidance. Mm. Right. People do need guidance. They need to be able to sift through. And you know, the best performing fund rotates every two, three years. Yes. So it's not easy uh, to identify what's the right fund, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think the over the number of years, the regulation has been kudos to SEBI. Regulation has been tightened so much that the difference in commission between fund A, B, C. X, Y, Z, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, difference is narrowed down consistently, mm. which means that commission is less and less of an influence for a distributor mm. and meritocracy of products and performance and teams managing those funds is getting more and more uh, prevalence. Okay. That's how it's playing okay, out. That's a, okay, so that's interesting insight and uh, it, it's also interesting because you have uh, the insight from a previous organization as well as one that you've set up and that is growing very rapidly. Uh, do you have any uh, unique insights from one to the other in terms of getting your name out there? Mm, yeah. uh, does the distribution community help or is is it word on the street? Is it uh, How does it work? So I'll tell you, like, you know, when an organization is new, uh, clearly uh, talking about yourself to the trade and making them know uh, is the first port of call. But I think thanks to you guys and thanks to the whole digital medium, uh, discovery happens pretty fast. And organically. Uh, and organically. Mm. Right? Because two things have happened. One is over the number of years, because of regulation, because of you guys, because of social media, because of awareness with investors, over the number of years, industries become more and more meritocratic. Mm. And also because of digital uh, platforms, it's become more and more uh, democratic. Mm. So first port of call, always it's the trade or the distributors, mm. which uh, you know get a brand out there. 
uh, but then otherwise organically also nowadays the timelines have got crunched in terms of how fast discovery plays out. Okay. Uh, coming back to the conversation on trail commission. So you've understood as things stand that there is a difference between direct and regular. The difference in the total expense ratio is effectively what the distribution fee is and what the distributor gets as a commission on a monthly basis. Now, there was something Kirtan called an upfront commission that doesn't exist anymore. What exists is a trail commission. How does that work? Uh, so Alex, what happens is in a trail commission, ideally what you're doing is uh, as long as that asset stays with you, you are uh, pro rata basis paid on on whatever was supposed to be paid out to you for the whole year. Let's take an what, example. What that means is, let's say if you have a hundred rupee of AUM and uh, probably a 1% was supposed to be paid out to you, you are ideally supposed to get one rupee for the asset staying with you for the entire year. Sure. But let's say if the asset stays only for 25% of the year, you get paid only 0.25 paisa, uh, depending on how long the asset has stayed with you. So that's how the industry has actually moved from the upfront uh, entry load slash payouts that were made earlier to a trail model wherein the incentives were aligned for the investor to stay invested and that's how the entire ecosystem benefits from the AMC to the investor and the distributor. So community. in your example, one rupee uh, calculated for the full year, assuming that the investor stayed for the full year, gets split over 12 months yeah. and each month it's calculated based on the AUM. Yes. Now, what is this new norm that we're talking about? Because we're talking about, say, okay, let's take an example, right? Kirtan is a distributor, I'm a distributor. I was selling a product, I sold uh, and uh, and you know, mutual a mutual fund scheme, uh, and I was earning the trail commissions. Now, he has convinced the investor that he's better than I am, and therefore the investor shifted. Yeah. The investor was not getting the trail commissions in that situation, right? Yes. That was the old rule. Yes. What was happening to the amount that was set aside for the distribution? So whatever the amount is would remain, see, you know, because uh, these things work on provisions, because there are no accurate numbers, sure. right? I mean, you're making an estimate that on these much of assets, uh, I have this much of uh, part of the assets raised from a regular plan and some part of the assets raised in a direct plan, yeah. yeah. right? And as you'll appreciate, all of this is in percentage points. Sure. So let us say starting of the month, the assets are 100 crores. End of the month, the assets are 110 crores. Mm. Then through the average of that, there is an average trail commission across all distributors. Mm -hmm. So there is a, you know, you're making a provision in the scheme saying that by end of month, I need to debit this much, but mm. the actual calculation will happen later. Sure. Correct? So obviously, there are large pools mm. And to a small extent where, you know, the, there is change of code and for that particular asset, which may be a minuscule proportion, you're not going to pay, despite having made a provision, you're not going to pay sure. that. So, that, so there will be some excess provision that will get rolled over. It will be set off against some future commissions, etc. Got it. So it, actually, it's not a very big part uh, of the overall assets or the overall commission uh, paid out. Hmm. But what is interesting to keep in mind is that till now, the rule was that even if the customer decides that I want to move from Alex to Kirtan, mm -hmm. right? The policy was that, you know, sometimes you might, he might be doing something to, you know, uh, lure the customer under some false promises. He might indulge in mis-selling. He might say that, okay, Alex has given you this scheme, but you know, there's something wrong with it and he's not updating you, I'll update you. If, I, if, you, re if you invest with me, I, you will get better returns. Mm -hmm. You know, or in the olden days when the rules were not strict, you know, you say that, okay, I'll give you, I'll pass back some of the incentive back to you. Right. There were very many malpractices for which the door would be left open hmm. if we allowed this kind of switching and commissions to move. So what is happening now though? Yeah, so at one point in time, the Association of Mutual Funds decided that, you know, to end all malpractices, let's do one thing. If a customer says, change my distributor, we will not pay any commission to the new distributor so that there is no incentive. change happening because of malpractices or incentive it happens purely based on probably giving better service mm -hmm. and then over a period of time that new new distributor would get more wallet share from the customer or otherwise would grow uh, the business mm -hmm. and if this fund doesn't perform at some point in time in future it may get switched and then the right now what we are now what the association of mutual funds has said is that to not pay commission forever and ever probably doesn't make sense sure. so let's do one thing when there is a change of broker code don't pay for the first six months. Cooling period. Yeah, cooling period. So don't pay for the first six months. After six months, if you find that after changing the broker code, the customer has remained with the new distributor, it means that maybe he's happy with that decision and there was no malpractice and you know it's been done for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. So after six months, you start 
paying the commission. Hmm. So I think it's only fair and square because what will happen is that no malpractice at the same time, no reason to keep churning the assets. Yes. We've tried to give you an understanding of how trail commissions work and how the norms have changed. Now we're talking about who benefits. Kirtan, uh, of course, you've been distributing for some time. Uh, what according to you is, if at all, a section of the mutual fund distributor community that will benefit? Will competition be ramped up in a big way? Alex, I think there are three three different ways to look at this. I think there are three people who will really benefit. First is the good guys will benefit. Because uh, the industry so far was in a way where you had these assets. Even if you didn't do anything on the assets, which is value addition, you were still getting paid the trail commission and getting paid a higher commission every time the AUM went up without you really doing anything. And hence, everybody will have to pull up their socks to now make sure that you are adding value for the money that you are making. Mm. And if you don't do that, you will get switched to a good uh, distributor or an MFD who's going to bring that value on board. So I definitely believe the good guys will benefit. Second, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, private bankers or wealth managers who've been who've been a part of the system for a long time, but they've not been able to move out and start on their own because it was not easy to move assets, right? And now those guys will benefit and the investor community will definitely benefit because so far what was happening is even if you know that the person that you were working with mm. was not adding value, but for you to switch to somebody else was always a task because for the newer distributor to really make money or get incentivized, you would have had to sell your schemes and Correct. buy new schemes and pay capital gains tax. Now what can happen is, if you've identified whom you're working with uh, and you're not comfortable and you want to move to somebody else, you can change the broker. The newer broker will also be incentivized and you will save on capital gains tax. So I think uh, all these three sections, in my opinion, should benefit, Alex. Do you think there's uh, another category that will benefit? Or do you think there's another implication that we are not talking about yet? No, not really. I think Kirtan has covered it comprehensively. I think it's a good move because, you know, if you say that, okay, you're not happy with a particular distributor, you want to move to a new distributor, the new distributor is not going to get any trail, hmm. then he's all, he or she is also not sufficiently incentivized to provide better service to a newly acquired customer. So I think it's a win-win in that sense. And uh, it's good that, you know, for at least for clients, it's going to be a positive. It should be. Uh, so don't be surprised if uh, you get a few calls. I don't know if it's going to be as aggressive as that. Maybe you guys should tell me uh, on the comment section over the course of the coming weeks whether or not you get uh, approached by your neighbor's distributor or, uh, or something like that. But it's interesting uh, because uh, incidentally, I was having a conversation with uh, a friend about their investment portfolio. Uh, and uh, they were saying that, and, and I think Ashish, this is it may be something that you can tell me about as well, because I know that you do a lot of conversations that give yeah. you insight of how investors behave. Mm -hmm. And what she was saying is that she has had a distributor for the last three years. Mm -hmm. She's had a decent 18 odd percent uh, CAGR on yeah. an equity portfolio. She's found out that her aunts have been getting a 20 plus percent CAGR and she wants to shift to that distributor, okay? Huh. So this is the context that she gave me and she showed me the schemes that were being offered by the second distributor and right enough, there were three small cap schemes out of six that were being offered. So I was taken aback because I was wondering, hey, you know, what is the benefit of having three small cap schemes? Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is, are these still being aggressively sold? And I'm asking in the context of the AMFI numbers that came yeah. out for the month yeah. of February. Yeah. Seemingly, there's a deceleration in mid cap and small cap, but is that happening on the ground? No, 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 not really. I think asset managers have been getting more and more cautious and conscious. And you saw that regulatory nudge also about planning yeah. liquidity and stuff. So uh, this time around, what I've seen asset managers uh, have been a bit more conservative and a bit more cautious. But if you see the flows, not a big discernible slowdown. Uh, in fact, uh, for the month of February, the gross inflow into equity mutual fund schemes, if I just take pure equity mm -hmm. and you take this balanced hybrid equity oriented funds, that gross inflow was well north of some 73, 74,000 crores. And I'm right. not even counting ETFs and index funds and the uh, EPFO's money and stuff. Which is a record. One 74, yeah. 74 is probably the largest, right? Uh, and uh, so you can see that there's no let up really speaking. 
uh, it always happens. You know, I, I always tell on a lighter note that some people do a lot of analysis and buy what's working well in the last one year, <laughs> and some people don't do any analysis and still buy what is working well in the last <laughs> one year. So <laughs> the former are just trying to justify why they are buying last one yeah. year, and the other ones are directly buying last one year. Mm. So there's this huge, pen, huge penchant for people to buy what worked well mm. in the last one or two years. But markets are mean reverting and they are cyclical. So in fact, uh, if you have anything to see in the last one year, you should make sure you don't buy what worked very well in the last one year. Fair point. Are you, are you uh, changing? I, I know for a fact that you have over the last few weeks and months, I think, changed the kind of messaging you're giving your clients. Uh, what, what does it stand at right now? I think, Alex, look, if you're a long-term investor, you largely want to stick to your asset allocation, which fits your risk profile. Uh, but of course, this may not work for every client. Sure. But there are definitely some clients for whom you have a small tactical allocation given the nature of the work that you really want to do and you have an understanding with the client. Mm. So on the technical side of uh, the bet, I think we've had this conversation multiple times that for 24, we've had large cap allocation and we've reduced small cap. Mm. But I think this is, look, getting this to be done on the ground is as difficult, as easy as it looks yeah. while we talk, right? Is because now when you look back four months, you would say that this call went right, but it's not always that your calls will go wrong and you'll have to be more prudent understanding whether or not you're okay taking a bet at this kind of valuation in the small caps, whereas the large caps have not done well. I mean, we were talking last one year, large caps have done what, 17, 18%? Sure. Mid was 40, 40 small plus. was 45, yeah. right? And like Ashish said, there's always mean reversion, right? It's it's only prudent for you to allocate some more money to large cap because that's that's where probably value is. So, so the context, of course, uh, is for the last part of this conversation, which is that the market regulators come in and said, look, hey, you need to disclose more yeah, yeah. on the liquidity side and certain other risk management uh, aspects, which I guess mutual funds are doing anyway. Yeah. But on the 15th of the month, there will have to be a report on certain aspects. Yeah. What does that change for you? No, so basically, uh, on a, it says that we have to report. I mean, whatever work we may be doing, like we have a chief risk officer, which is, by the way, a regulated position reporting to trustees and the Securities and Exchange Board. So we do all of that work. You know that what is the top distributor concentration, mm. top five distributors deploying money with us, top investors deploying money with us. What is the concentration? Uh, you know, what is the biggest redemption we've received in the past? Mm. If we receive such a redemption, how much? So all kinds of liquidity analysis. What is the liquidity of each and every stock? How many days it will tell us to completely take us to completely exit? Mm. The, all of that we do, right? Now what we have to just do is that we have to publicly disclose what was internal. So, you know, we, d we supply fact sheets to investors. Yes. So they see our portfolios, they see sectoral allocations, they see who's the portfolio manager, what type of team, what performance. They see all of these things and buy a fund. Yeah. Now the regulator is probably nudging that look for one more thing, you know, mm. performance and all is well and good, but is this performance generated by having a lot of money just going pyramiding? So, you know, if you have illiquid stocks in your portfolio mm. and you get huge inflow, you keep buying your own stocks. Right. So then, you know, that just keeps flying. So sometimes the impact cost, sometimes a lot of flow into a few number of schemes, hence putting money into few number of stocks. Mm. So the regulator is just telling investors that amongst the many things you look at, make sure that you look at this also. That's the intent of making public disclosure. Mm. And I think the onus will then fall onto the distributor community and the advisory community to utilize that information, of course, to the investor as well, uh, because this uh, inf information is going to be publicly available. We'll try and break that down for uh, you as soon as we get a report like that to tell you how best you can utilize the information. But that brings us to the end of this particular edition of the Mutual Fund Show. Ashish, as well as Kirtan, thank you so much for joining us in the studio and for breaking down the latest changes in the mutual fund space. If you've got questions for us, you can write to us on the WhatsApp number that flashes occasionally at the bottom of your screen. There it is right now. <laughs> or in fact, on the social media platforms that you follow us on. Do stay tuned. Lots more coming up over the course of the day. And this is NDTV Profit.